Okay. We're starting a new series called Forever Changed. It's a four-week series. And this is... Week one is called From Saul to Paul. And we're going to start out with a prayer. I know we can't sit together and pray together, physically together, but in spirit we are praying together. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, these are difficult times, Lord, and uh, it is only through your will that we are still able to share what we know and what we've learned about you. And as we go forward, Father, I just my prayer is that you reach out and touch all these young lives. And Lord, uh, we ask that you open up your word every single day. Write it on our hearts continually. And as we have said a number of times, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that you are the Lord. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to start out by reading Psalm 103. And you can pause the video and turn to this psalm and read it along with me if you'd like. This Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not His benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear Him, and His righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep His commandments, His covenant, and remember to obey His precepts. The Lord has established His throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly host, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. I love that psalm. That is a pretty awesome psalm. Okay. Now, if you can see it behind me, we are looking at the book of Acts, verses, chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. And the bottom line here is, encountering Jesus changes your life. And the main question today, am I allowing Jesus to radically change me? So, names are kind of a big deal, don't you think? Whether you're in America or in England... You want to be sure to clearly communicate who, what, or where you are talking about in a way that is understood. If you say the word crumpet here, no one knows what you're talking about. In England, it's a cookie. And there's, a, there's so many different things. Foods are a big thing in both countries, but we use different words for different things here in the United States. Using the wrong term might literally mean talking about something different. In today's lesson, we're going to look at the life of a man who was so radically affected by his encounter with Jesus that his name even changed. How many of you are good at remembering people's names? I'm not. That's a gift if it comes naturally to you. 
and a valuable skill if you have learned how to do that well. There's nothing worse than confidently saying someone's name only to find out it's the wrong name. My dad, this is a story about me, my dad grew up with two brothers and a sister. He married and had eight kids. He had three sons and five daughters. When we were teenagers every once in a while, we would catch dad calling us by the names of our brothers or sisters, usually when he's mad. Now it's a slip up that sometimes got laughter. Sometimes you didn't want to say a word. Because names are so important and a dad should be able to keep the names of his sons and daughters straight, wouldn't you think? So, here we go back to uh, what we're talking about in the book of Acts. You may or may not know it, but a doctor named Luke did a ton of research and interviews and put all of his gathered information together into a document about Jesus' life and ministry. And we have it in our Bibles as the book of Luke. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? Did you know that was only the first of a two-volume set? Hmm. Luke also carefully recorded the history of how the church started after Jesus rose to heaven, sharing the story of the lives of the early Christians, including some of his own personal adventures. Today, he introduces us to a man who seems to be the villain of this story, but who quickly becomes a totally different kind of person in the story that God was writing for us. And also today, we're beginning a brand new series called Forever Changed. Are you forever changed? I know I have been. In the next four lessons, we'll study the amazing transformation that happened in the life of Paul, who was first introduced to us as... Saul, in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, you can open your Bible and read it along with me. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, do you know what the way is? That's being a Christian. So here this Saul guy goes, and he's arresting people. He doesn't sound like someone you would expect Luke to write about if he wants to share what God is doing. But wait, there's more. To get a better picture of who this guy is, we have to jump forward a little bit to when he's telling his story to a crowd of people in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 22, verses 3 through 5, he says, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Sicilia, Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of his way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. So Saul explains how he grew up as a Jew in the most important Jewish city, Jerusalem, with one of the best teachers, Gamaliel. And yet, Saul passionately tried to shut down Christians by having them arrested, imprisoned, and we know some of them were even killed. He called them followers of the way, as that's what they commonly called Christians at that time. That's his background. Now, we get to where Jesus enters the story. Okay? In Acts, we go back to chapter 9, Acts 9, verses 3 through 9. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. 
Now the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now there, there's a sentence here, a question. In verse 5, he said, Who are you, Lord? Well, he already had an idea that he was talking to God. But he wasn't sure exactly if this was Jesus or God. But Jesus told him who he was. So I'm not, I'm not sure about you, but I'm glad my experience like with Jesus wasn't quite like Saul's. Of course, I haven't gone around having Christians beaten, arrested, or put in prison. And Saul hears Jesus' voice, and then there is this bright light from heaven. He's knocked to the ground, and when he stands up, he's blind. So his friends lead him to Damascus. It's like Jesus told him to. And for three days he goes without eating anything or drinking anything. He's probably spending a lot of time in prayer and thought, processing what had happened and how he has been living his life. So we're going to read about a little bit about how this part of Saul's story wraps up. Remember, he's still named Saul. So verses 10 through 22 in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Wow. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and you could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, they couldn't believe the change in this guy. So later in Luke's history of the church, he records in Acts 13, verse 9, Saul, also known as Paul. We're not exactly sure when his name changed, but we are sure that his experience changed him. And as Luke reports, records Paul's story from Acts 13 on, he only refers to him as Paul. And we all know him as Paul. Aren't you glad you didn't get to meet the guy named Saul? So I want you to notice a few things here. Number one, Jesus radically changed Paul's life. So in case you missed it, and I'm sure you didn't, we started Saul's story in Acts 13. 9, with Luke writing, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. And then, just 20 verses later, Luke writes of this same man. In Acts 9, verse 22, Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus could not refute his pure proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Amen. But what? He went from hunting down followers of Jesus to shut down this seemingly crazy movement 
of people who he thought were going against God to becoming a man who told people the truth that Jesus was indeed the Savior sent by God and he helped them follow him. That is a total change. That's a radical change. Jesus is able to radically change our lives also. You might think that this was something special God did a long time ago in history. You might be thinking God might not know who you are. Similarly to the way some people struggle with the names of other people. You might think Jesus doesn't care about you. You're one of seven billion people on the planet. And you are totally wrong if you believe this. Saul, Saul's life was so radically changed that he started churches and cities where he traveled. He then visited those places to see how the Christians were doing. When he couldn't be there in person, he wrote letters. If he had lived today, he might have been a popular author or a blogger. I like to think that, a blogger. Paul the blogger. He wrote a lot of letters, and that's what bloggers do. The Christians kept those letters and shared them with other believers because they were so full of the truths about Jesus. Many of those letters are still around today, filling up most of what we call the New Testaments in our Bible. Each name for a city and a church Paul was writing to, or the name of the person he was writing his letter to. The same Jesus who transformed Paul's life is around today and can transform your life too. Now we're going to look at more of Paul's life and ministry over the next few weeks. Trust me, as we do, you will see that if God can do some powerful work through someone that used to be literally his enemy, you are not too bad or too far away from God for him to totally change your life. And if you are here and you are following Jesus, but your life doesn't look as totally changed as Paul's, Maybe you need to take an honest evaluation of whether or not you have allowed Jesus to transform your life. Imagine how different our church, our schools, and community would be if we allowed Jesus to totally change the way he changed us all. Now this is uh, some good stuff for us to discuss in our small groups. And as you go this week, think about this question. Am I allowing Jesus to radically change me. Attached to this video, in this week's lesson, are there are four discussion questions. Now you can just read these to yourself, which some of you will, and think about what these questions are asking. Or you can read these with your family. The discussion questions, go over them with your family. This would be a great opportunity for you to talk to your family about some of the things that you learn in your Sunday school class. And now guess what time it is? Time for the Jesus Connection! I miss hearing all you guys sing that. I really do. The Jesus Connection. John chapter 10, verse 3. Jesus says, The doorkeeper opens the door for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus knows each and every one of us by name. Pray this week that you always feel that God takes care of you and knows your name all the time, every day.